Hello. Welcome to Ahmed AAS WGS Open Classroom 2023 Day of Remembrance at SFSU. Never forget, never repeat. I'm Dr. Tomomi Kinekawa, lecturer faculty in Women and Gender Studies at SFSU. I'd like to start our open classroom with land acknowledgement adopted by AIS in 2014. The campuses of San Francisco State University on the San Francisco Peninsula and North Bay are located within the occupied territories of Ramaytash Ohlone and Coastal Miwok, who, along with Southern Pomo, are organized as the Federated Indians of Granton Rancheria. On Wednesday morning last week, when our open classroom was originally scheduled, we woke up and learned about Israel's military siege and massacre in Nablus, Palestine. Nablus is Dr. Rabab Abdurhadi's hometown. She's one of our co-organizers and panelists today. Following Israel's recent military raids in Janin, the Israeli military murdered at least 10 Palestinians in Nablus, including children and elderly and several young militants. Over 100 were wounded, many hit by Israeli ammunition and a drone attack that bombed the building where they lived. A general strike was called throughout Palestine to protest Israeli violence and honor the martyrs. With outrage, we stand in solidarity with people in Nablus, Palestine, demanding rematriation and repatriation of indigenous lands and the Palestinian right of return. May 15, 2023 will be the 75th year of the ongoing Nakba by construction of the Jewish only settler colonial state of Israel in Palestine based on the racist ideology of Zionism expulsion of approximately 750,000 Palestinians in 1948, where today between 5 to 7 million still living as stateless refugees, destruction of over 500 Palestinian towns, villages, and neighborhoods by countless military and militia raids and quote-unquote ethnic cleansing campaigns. In an email to us, Kei Shimizu wrote, that 2023, she's also our co-organizers and co-panelists today. She wrote that 2023 also marks the 81st anniversary of Ex Executive Order 1966, which led to the mass incarceration of 120,000 120, persons of Japanese ancestry as quote-unquote enemy aliens during World War II. Those included both U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens, including immigrant residents. Also interned were over 32,000 people, including children of Japanese, German, Italian, and Jewish ancestry in the U.S., and those subjected to extraordinary rendition from 18 Latin American countries. In our event announcement, we stated the Day of Remembrance, DOR, is an annual community commemoration and a vehicle for remembrance, education, and activism, especially for redress reparations for Japanese American, Japanese Latin American communities. We remember the racist mass incarceration of those labeled by the US government as enemy aliens during World War II, demand racial justice, and strengthen grassroots solidarity among our communities. 2023 Day of Remembrance at SFSU, Never Forget, Never Repeat, calls on our students, colleagues, and community members to insist on the indivisibility of justice and to strengthen our third world solidarities, highlighting our rejection of anti-Black violence, anti-Indigenous violence, anti-Asian violence, and violence against all communities, and the escalating Islamophobic, anti-Arab, and anti-Palestinian attacks on Ahmed studies, that is Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies on our campus. In the context of the white supremacist repression on critical race theory, critical ethnic studies in many states, including recent cases of banning AP African American studies in Florida and Texas, Dr. Abdurhadi's radical praxis of the indivisibility of justice and innovative anti-colonial pedagogy became the main target of Zionist racist attacks. 
Darwinists have attempted to dismantle Ahmed studies through falsely and strategically equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, violently suppressed critiques of Israel's settler colonialism and silenced anti-colonial narratives for justice. Remembering the 19 SFSU Japanese students who were forced out of school in 1942 to be incarcerated as enemy alien, we recognize the urgency of defending Ahmed at our university today and its national and international implications. So we will never allow our campuses to become mouthpieces for repressive state power and Zionist racist agenda. In her influential chapter titled, uh, quote, Contesting the Foreign Domestic Divide, Arab Revolutions and American Studies, um, Dr. Rabab Abdurhadi highlighted that, quote, US collusion with Zionism stems from the U.S.-Israel affinity as two settler colonial states that need to support each other and pursue expansionist designs, end of quote. Dr. Abdurhadi further maintains, again, quote, only a grassroots movement that is grounded in an indivisible sense of justice that does not rank oppression can challenge U.S. and Israeli designs. This movement must be led by indigenous communities whose struggles mirror that of the Palestinians and by communities of color who experience structural racism and other forms of dis disfranchisement at the hands of the US government, end of the quote. Using Dr. Abdurhadi's influential theoretical framing as our guide throughout our discussion today, we will learn political significance of the DOR and learn from a close collaboration between Ahmed studies and uh, Asian American studies holding DOR commemoration on SFSU campus since 2016. Remembering past violences and demanding ac accountability is also critical in a collective critique of the ongoing collusion of imperial ethno-nationalist governments, including US, Israel, Japan, and India, among others, and their construction of ethno-nationalist supremacy at all levels. We resist those imperial states' construction of citizens, non-citizens, undocumented, and enemy aliens, good and bad Arabs, Muslims, and Asians, that divide our communities, essentialize ethno-national supremacies, and to exceptionalize Palestine. In this sense, we need to stress that BDS principles must apply to our own institutions and communities for education and knowledge production, where those imperial states attempt to institutionalize and delegitimize Israel's massacres, apartheid, and cetera colonialism. As we remember 19 Japanese students and Japanese Latin Americans who await redress after 81 years, we must fight against expanding Zionist bases and influences at the US neoliberal and imperial universities including SFSU administration and the Division of Equity and Community Inclusion at SFSU that recently colluded in sponsoring an exclusive and racist report against justice for and in Palestine and specifically named the and targeted Ahmed studies. It is then deliberately appropriate that 2023 DOR at SFSU is co-sponsored by Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies, Asian American studies, and women and gender studies. Our co-organizers and co-panelists are Dr. Rabab Abdurhadi, director and senior scholar of Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies, Grace Shimizu, director of Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project, um, Campaign for Justice Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans and uh, Comfort Women Justice Coalition. Dr. Wesley Winton, Professor of Asian American Studies at the SFSU and Co-Director of Edison Luno Institute of Nikkei and Uchinanchu Studies um, at the SFSU, and myself. Um, and um, students in my WGS 150, Women and Gender in U.S. History and Society, as well as students in Dr. Wei Munten's courses on Akinawan heritages and Asians in the U.S. and the Worldwide Teaching Palestine series of Dr. Abdul Hadi are participating in the open classroom today. Um, I would especially like to thank Leith Golam, doctoral graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and Salim Shahade, PhD candidate at UCLA, both um, SFSU alumni and disability 
assistance to Dr. Abdul Hadi for stepping in for tech support to make today's webinar possible. Um, so we will have a couple of rounds among all the panelists. And um, in the first round, uh, Grace Shimizu will start us off by discussing what this DOR um, and why we need the struggles for redress and recognition and apology. And um, Dr. Wewenden will follow Grace Shimizu and then Dr. Abdul Hadi will discuss why I get involved in DOR. Um, in the second round, we'll discuss the significance of remembering for justice, indivisibility of justice and the third world left solidarity. Um, at the end, uh, we will also have Q and A's um, section, hopefully, and uh, so please post your questions and comments um, on that uh, online streaming. And um, so, um, so I'd like to pass this uh, mic to Grace um, Thank you, Tomomi. Yes, my name is Grace Shimizu. I join you from the place now known as Oakland, California, which is within the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded or stolen land of the many tribes of the Ohlone people who have and continue to be stewards of the land throughout the generations. On behalf of the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans and the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project, I'm honored to join you on this Day of Remembrance at San Francisco State University. For the Nikkei community in the US, for us who are immigrant residents and US citizens of Japanese ancestry, for us who lived through World War II and for us the descendants, Day of Remembrance is a heartfelt tradition, an anchoring community institution. It is a time when we reaffirm our community's wartime experience during one of the most shameful chapters in US history. It is a time when we recall those experiences, share our memories, and remember our loved ones, especially those who have passed on, who endured so much and gave so much so that we could have a better life. But Day of Remembrance is not just about remembering and paying tribute to our past. An integral component of this community tradition has been and continues to be the call for action, for activism for activism, the ongoing struggles for truth, justice, government accountability, and for redress and reparations. This annual commemoration is now observed on or near February 19th, the date in 1942 when President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, authorizing unjust mass exclusion and incarceration, and setting in motion the tragic events that have not been fully redressed after eight decades. But the first DOR pilgrimage and program was held on November 25, 1978. On a Thanksgiving weekend, over 2,000 people gathered in Seattle, Washington, and drove in a caravan stretching nearly four miles on the freeway. Their destination was Puyallup Fairgrounds, which in 1942 had become the Camp Harmony detention facility. There they joined another 1,000 for a total of over 3,000 participants. The most immediate effect on the first day of remembrance was that people began talking more openly about their wartime experiences. Many who had been incarcerated talked about their experiences with their children and grandchildren for the first time that day. As Frank Abe recalled the event two decades later, it was an emotional breakthrough for our community. It made it okay for Nikkei to say that what was in their hearts, that purely up, um, Day of Remembrance led to other cities hosting their own events and our communities breaking of the silence. So we come together today in this Day of Remembrance, which is rooted in collective remembrance, reflection, educati education, and activism for social justice and redress. We come together as diverse communities and reach out to each other to build mutual understanding, respect, trust, and solidarity. We come together to reaffirm our commitment to uphold the fundamental constitutional and human rights of all people, 
especially the right to government redress and reparations of vulnerable or marginalized individuals and communities for violations, for their oppression, whether perpetrated long ago in the present or in the future. And part of that call to action is to hold the U.S. government accountable for its still unfinished World War II redress business. The reparation struggles for the Nikkei community is not over, and the shameful chapter in our country's history is not closed. Phase two of the redress movement is underway. Phase one culminated with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. It was redress legislation which acknowledged the wrongful treatment of over 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry during World War II. It granted reparations to over 80,000 surviving U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents of Japanese ancestry who suffered incarceration, which included public acknowledgement, an apology letter, $20,000 compensation and a public education fund. But the restrictive eligibility criteria excluded thousands who suffered constitutional and human rights violations from the JA community, as well as German and Italian immigrants and their US ch uh, citizen children, and those Japanese, German, Italian, and Jewish immigrant residents and citizens from 18 Latin American countries. Phase two of the Japanese American redress movement began as the former JLA internees carried on the redress struggle. My father and other families were among the over 2,200 JLAs who were kidnapped from 13 Latin American countries, interned in Department of Justice concentration camps in the US, used in two hostage exchanges and subjected to post-war deportations and economic exploitations. These crimes against humanity were perpetrated under the U.S. government's World War II enemy alien program, specifically the Latin American extraordinary rendition component. We could not find proper justice in the U.S., despite five lawsuits and two failed pieces of legislation. But in 2020, we tasted victory when the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights published its decision that the U.S. government owed meaningful material and moral reparations to the JLAs for the fundamental human rights that were violated during World War II. And because there has been no meaningful action by the Biden administration nor the U.S. Congress, these violations are ongoing and our struggle continues. We invite you to join us in the struggle. We do this not only for our families, our community. We do this so what happened to us does not happen to you, to your family, to your community. We want and need to do this with you to expand our understanding of historical truth and to defend democracy. The JLA struggle is part of the larger struggle against racism, white supremacy, nativism, xenophobia, authoritarianism, and for truth, peace, justice, and democracy. I'll put up some links in the chat so you can learn more about the JA and JLA wartime and redress histories, as well as the World War II enemy alien experience. Please check us out at the Campaign for Justice website, the EAF, uh, Enemy Alien Files online exhibit, and the websites of the National Japanese American Historical Society and Densho. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. And um, uh, um, we'll have more discussion uh, on uh, what you spoke about. But uh, I'd like to pass this mic to um, Dr. Wellington now. Um, Thank you. Uh uh, Dr. Kinokawa. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abduhadi and uh, Grace uh, Shimizu. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I am on uh, Ohlone Ramitush land. I grew up in Hawaii, so I, my family's family are settlers on Kanaka Maoli land. Um, my family is from Okinawa. My ancestors are from uh, Okinawa, uh, which is the indigenous land uh, of 
uh, my ancestors and uh, relatives, friends. Um, I also uh, apologize uh, deeply. I can only stay a, a short while. Uh, I'll have to um, be leaving soon. Um, but I'd like to talk about um, DOR uh, here at San Francisco State. Um, and I believe we started our first DOR at State was in 2016. And from the very start, uh, it was uh, Ahmed uh, and Asian American Studies. We worked together. Um, and I'm trying to remember how it all started. Um, and I'm trying to remember how I got to know Professor Abdul Hadi. I just don't remember. It was just one of those things we, uh, along with uh, Dr. Kinokawa and with Grace, <laughs> we go back a long time. I just don't remember how that happened. Um, but it was a um, sort of natural coming together. Um, and um, I think what we've been engaging in throughout these years is connecting the dots, uh, connecting the dots of um, shared experiences under uh, imperialism, colonialism, militarism, uh, and other uh, um, vicious structures of uh, inequality and oppression and violence. Um, and through our involvement, uh, we, we've been able to create a community across um, departments uh, across communities, um, and um, one one of the good things I remember was um, the film by uh, Conrad Adler that we we showed at the first uh, at uh, back in 2016, and I think subsequently. Um, so that uh, that tied the different communities together, the um, Japanese American community together with the. Uh, Arab and Muslim uh, community together. Um, what also came about with our uh, what they remembered here at San Francisco State was um, working with uh, uh, Professor Francis Wong and the cultural com component. Mm -hmm. So we also had these, uh, along with the open classrooms, we've had um, ceremonies. Uh, on the Garden of Remembrance uh, on, on campus. And um, this year, we were not able to do that. Uh, we were able to do it last year, and I look forward to doing it again next year. Uh, but on the Garden of Remembrance, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, it's the garden uh, behind Burke Hall, and there are 10 boulders, each boulder representing a concentration camp uh, that held Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, so we've had uh, these beautiful events, um, uh, interfaith events, uh, where we commemorated uh, the, those who were interned during World War II, uh, as well as others who've been incarcerated throughout the world. Uh, and uh, Professor Francis Wong and I, we've often uh, had a musical component to that. Uh, so in this, um, in the Garden of Remembrance events, we've been incorporating music uh, and creative arts into uh, into uh, this commemoration. Um, and lastly, um, I just started thinking, what is radical? Uh, what what is radical in in these times? Uh, we often talk about being radical and revolutionary uh, in our classes in Asian American studies. Uh, I can imagine uh, in other in women and gender studies in Ahmed. Um, but from a personal point of view, it's it, the radical in this context of uh, colonialism, militarism, imperialism, and other uh, structures of violence, uh, violent inequalities. It's radical is what is commonplace to all of us is to come together in community uh, and to be there for each other, uh, to share each other's um, pain, to to remember together. Um, and I feel uh, 
that's what their remembrance is about. Uh, it is radical in, in, in the language that that's forced upon us uh, uh, to be to each be in our silos uh, to be divided coming together like this uh, is radical and uh, I've been absolutely honored uh, to be able to be part of this uh, this community um, so thank you very much thank you very much um, I'd like to pass this to uh, Dr. Rabab Abdurhadi. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I also add that I do acknowledge that we at San Francisco State is on indigenous Torian Aloni Aramatish land. And uh, I, I believe, as I said it uh, before, that it's really important for everybody to acknowledge, but not only to engage in the process of acknowledgement. Uh, as just something that we do, routine, something that we really need to also make sure that we are participating in supporting the struggles of all indigenous uh, people and all people who have been wronged to be able to retrieve their rights, which is the basic uh, um, uh, reason for actually having this classroom. I wanted to actually go over the history of, uh, and we will answer some of the questions uh, uh, Dr. Yotan about how we got, we met and so on. I don't know exactly when we met, but I remember multiple occasions. I, I think maybe the first time we met was in 2012, Day of Remember at the Kabuki Theater, uh, when uh, uh, it was uh, uh, Reverend Michael Yoshi, who actually arranged for a Palestinian leader from Chicago, Hatim Abu Dhabi, who was targeted to speak at the Day of Remembrance. Uh, and uh, then we actually organized an event at the at the Buena Vista United Methodist Church, where uh, Hatem was speaking. We showed the film uh, Enemy Alien. Conrad Adderer uh, came. I spoke, but I actually in the 2012 I met Grace at uh, at the Day of Remembrance, and there was this table about Japanese Peruvians. So we when we started chatting, and we it was it was actually some of the information that we really didn't know about the whole question of rendition. We knew about the, 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 the incarceration of Japanese Americans and uh, Japanese people who may or may not have US citizenship and other nationalities in the incarceration camps. What we did not know about actually the Japanese uh, Peruvians until actually Grace, who did an amazing job of educating us uh, again and again. But I wanted to also talk about the history that this goes back a long time ago in the sense that there is in the in the some of the stuff I will say even I learned and my contemporary learned and other Palestinians, this is something that drilled into in our minds, sort of the same kind of solidarity with African Americans, with indigenous people, with Latinx people. I mean, this is something that we learn about as we grow up. And specifically one of the main events that everybody knows about is the condemnation of the nuclear a bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, everybody knows that around. And so there is, and then that was much earlier on. In the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of uh, collaboration between various radical uh, groups and organizations in, in, in Japan and in Palestine, which can be another uh, process of uh, discussion. But also uh, there is many things that have happened afterwards, especially in the, in the 80s, uh, when the Los Angeles 8 case in Los Angeles, California, seven Palestinians and a Kenyan woman were raided by the FBI, INS, at the time it was called Immigration Naturalization Service, and secret police, 200 agents, raided them, shackled them, handcuffed them, and took them. And then one of the papers in LA said, War on Terrorism hits LA. And it was a process by which the Reagan administration intentionally wanted to say to uh, uh, scare the Palestinians and basically use the Palestinian case as because the community was very active. And I actually remember clearly hearing about that the same night or the night, the morning, that scaring us, uh, creating a chilling effect. So everybody will basically be silent. Nobody will say anything. And then in the, in the Palestinian community, but also as a chilling effect for other communities as well. At that time, the Reagan administration was very much involved in trying to crush a solidarity with the people of Central America, especially the Committee in Solidarity with the people of El Salvador, 
the people who were supporting Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, Guatemala. And then what happened is that uh, they were unable to do that. They were trying to do all sorts of things. The Reagan administration was uh, very much intensely organizing the Contra, support for the Contras, support for intervention in Central America. But they couldn't really crush the Central America movement. There had been like a quarter of a million people from the U.S. who went to Central America and visited. The movement was very strong. So they thought that targeting the Palestinians would be the weakest link. And if you target the Palestinians, then a lot of other uh, movements will be will be crushed. Now, the problem is that as the attacks against us continue, and all of us, I'm talking not just about Ahmed and me and Palestine, against all of us continue, sometimes it backfires. So what happened at that point in the Palestinian community itself, three buses from the Ferris Com got on the buses and went to the prison to protest and support the people who were incarcerated inside. Many people from civil rights organizations, civil liberties, and so on, joined with the Palestinians to say this is unacceptable, completely unacceptable, and we're going to fight around it. So it's actually built a big movement around why are you prosecuting people who are distributing magazines, who are doing the Dabke, which is the Palestinian national dance, uh, speaking about it, educating, and so on. And then also specifically the Japanese community, this is where it becomes, people said that we are going to go and support the Palestinians. That was even actually before we discovered that there was a plan called Alien, Terrorists and Undesirables. You want to talk about alien, enemy alien, Alien, Terrorists and Undesirables. That was designed by the, the vice president of uh, the United States, uh, George Herbert Bush, Bush Sr. But he did it when he was the head of the CIA. And it actually spoke about part of the plan is to set up internment camps for citizens of seven Arab countries and Iran in Oakdale, Louisiana, because it's supposed to be quote unquote desert like, and they will incarcerate. And this is where they put the, and it was sort of, it, 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 it even, it created so much education within our communities, where you're talking Arab, Palestinian, Muslims, and so on, as well as in the Japanese. Community. So it was people where there was so much support that happened at that time. And this has continued. And th this was really, really important. That period was very, but also post 9-11, 2001, the Japanese community also came and said to people, the, to the Palestinians, Muslims and Arabs, we are here. And when we talk about the El enemy alien, the film by, by Conrad Ederer, it is, actually speaks about that. People coming together, supporting, having each other's backs. I mean, this is this was really, really important. But uh, in, for us in particular, in 2002, Reverend Michael Yoshi was part of the uh, uh, presidential task force at San Francisco State that came out with the recommendation to set up a program that became Ahmed, Arab and Islamic program. He was on the task force. So when I came to San Francisco, he was already involved supporting the Palestinians around the mural, the students, and so on. And then when I came to San Francisco, I met him at the, the reception that the president, the provost, and the dean created for me. I mean, now San Francisco State claims that uh, this was a rogue dean, Ken Montero, and so on. But actually, they all did this big, we have this big reception that was recommended of the program that was on. But also we continued, we participated together in two, since 2008 also in the 40th anniversary of the of the uh, the strike, the 68th strike. We worked with each other, we met a lot of people. And also there have been many events, as I mentioned, at uh, the Buena Vista United Methodist Church. And uh, then we, we, and that's one way I said we showed enemy alien. Then we started showing enemy alien almost every class we had and always having some of this stuff. And I think you actually were at the 2012 uh, playing music. I mean, because you almost every year you go and participate there. And then, and also within the colleges, like people start kindred spirits kind of meet with it, see each other when people are talking about Okinawa and militarization and occupation. And of course, Michael Yoshi, Yoshi and Grace Shimizu played a very big role of actually bringing us together and kind of like, and I remember meeting, we actually met at Buena Vista to set up that, that event, 2016, we met together and we wanted to do it together and we wanted to do it in uh, San Francisco, but we didn't want to, do, we were doing it in our classes, but we thought actually, why not do it together with Asian American studies? So makes much more sense. So you and I and Grace and Michael were meeting, we would be meeting in the, go all the way to, uh, to Oakland, meet and organize. And then, uh, and uh, and we did it at the EP 116. We, we have the video, the video is available on Ahmed. We show it to all our students to learn all the time. But also since we were attacked, 
Uh, and then it was also, I was invited to the Day of Remembrance to be a keynote. Reverend Michael Yoshi invited me. It was very significant because he was getting the 25-year award, Human Rights Award at that time. So that was really very significant. We were attacked in 2013, 2014. The attacks against us by AMHA and other Zionist right-wing groups escalated, and they were always the signature from, I mean, didn't really need much, just the text, and then the signature will be there and the support and so on, meeting with the university. I also want to, I mean, that, that so that's the, 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 the class, and when we continue doing it. And the last one we did this was in 2019. If you recall, we did that. It wasn't the Day of Remembrance, actually. It was the Crystal City, report on the Crystal City. On the, uh, on the Declaration of Day of Remembrance, we did an event uh, that Ahmed initiated the year before at 2000, uh, at the EP116, and then we did one in your class, because we were supposed to do it in the library, and they canceled it on us. At the last minute, they canceled, gave it to an outside group, profit, whatever it is, and so on. So, But also during the Muslim ban, the Japanese uh, community stood by the by 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 us and actually spoke very clearly and i remember karen kuramatsu and uh, wrote an, an op-ed in the new york times about it saying that we don't really want your apology now saying that the enemy alien is not is not okay and the incarceration is not okay you have to be against everybody and and she spoke at many of our events as well i also want to say that i mean kind of like uh, uh, the, uh, the asian american studies also was one of the groups that signed that statement that the CARE, the Council on Arab uh, Islam, uh, American Islamic Relations, uh, did uh, against the, the Department of Edu Education, uh, complained by the Stand With Us, which is a main Zionist group. And they were complaining that I went and gave a lecture on Islamophobia in Professor Kayon Park's class, Race and Racism. And, and I was attacked. And uh, you know, all sorts of things started happening. And so on. actually, Asian American studies unanimously uh, passed the resolution and did it. But I think also the whole, the, 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 it's really important. And then, of course, the, 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 the collaboration that we've had with, uh, uh, um, you know, Tomomi and I, Dr. Kinakawa and I have been uh, organizing with each other actually from spring uh, 2020, right, from spring 2020 officially. But before that, we also, we were organizing with the Comfort Women Justice Coalition and so on. So there is a lot of history that has been going on and there is a lot of history that is going on within and now we're talking because we're speaking about Japanese Americans and then our fine I would say like one of the highlights of us was the invitation uh, by Grace and the Japanese Peruvian community to go to Crystal City. We were so honored to go and that's where we met the late Libby. Uh, may she rest in peace and power uh, in the Crystal City. It was the 60th anniversary. And I think that was very, very interesting because it was, it was Crystal City is historically has been a city, Mexican city, Latina city, although the government, all the powers were white supremacist US government and so on. And they've actually uh, welcomed the, the, the Japanese who were in internment camps. And we heard many stories, even about this uh, uh, abuela uh, making uh, tortillas and feeding sometimes because sometimes uh, people in the camps were not getting fed and so on. And then some some people will come from the government say to her, no, no, these are terrorists. You don't want to get in the. Like, I don't care. And her grandson was one of the persons who told us the story when we were in Crystal City. And this is really important because now, when there was the Muslim ban, uh, when uh, Trump tried to impose the Muslim ban, and then when he was also uh, making making all these racist white supremacist statements against Mexicans, against immigrants, against uh, people uh, without papers, and so on. Uh, it was really also people coming together and then the, the various day of remembrance for commemorations were saying never again, never again for anyone. And I also want to say kind of, we are speaking about Japanese and, and uh, the day of remembrance and we'll talk why I remember, but I think, and this is probably the last point I'll make is that the, it, it was really, really important also that many groups came in, groups that we are in coalition with our comrades, our allies, also from the Jewish community, the anti-Zionist uh, Jewish community, which is actually on the grassroots, it's far, it's it's it is much bigger than the Zionists who who have the money and the big mouths and the, the attacks against us. And they did also. They went to ICE offices and they protested and they said never again for anyone, because the Holocaust, the the, the slogan are never again. 
never again. And they said never again for anyone. And the Japanese community is saying never repeat history, never allow injustices to be committed against anybody. And these are, and I think this is where the whole question of radicalism that you, you know, speak about that uh, Tomomi, my Dr. Kinekawa, and uh, you, and that is being taught within the classroom, but also the stuff that's being taught outside of the classroom. We teach inside and outside of the classroom and connect. And this is also one of the things that really scare. I mean, Dr. Kinekawa, you spoke about the classes, the critical race theory that's being canceled, Asian American studies. People are not supposed to be teaching about the slavery, about the, 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 the settler colonialism in this country and so on, because they don't want people to hear about it. And one of the things we do in the open classroom is actually we bring people from inside and outside of the classroom. So that's actually is even more problematic and troubling, not only for the Zionist Israel lobby industries, but also for the right wing white supremacists who would like to prevent people from knowing and learning about each other. Because learning about each other for all of us actually advances our solidarity's understanding. And it becomes really difficult for anybody to say, I don't really care. This doesn't really concern me because it's a question of justice. Um, the, the, and I would also, I just forgot to mention that we did start a project with uh, Grace on the Japanese Peruvian remembrance and thinking about why remembers, but we can talk about that later. So it's, uh, I'm really honored to be part of this. I'm really honored to be part of the Day of Remembrance. I'm really, I was also in the Garden of Remembrance. And one of the things that is really troubling at San Francisco State is that most of our students see the murals but they do not know that there is a garden of resistance and uh, remembrance. And at the time when we did it, it was actually very corroded. And we spoke about that at the time. And now San Francisco State cleaned it up. But we actually want to see more in terms of not lip service about anti-Asian violence, Islamophobia, uh, um, anti-Palestinian racism, and so on and so forth, or anti-blackness. We want to see action. We don't really need just lip service. So I'll stop at that. I apologize. Thank you, Rabab and Grace and uh, Tomomi. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. I'm very touched. I um, I need to leave, but um, I'd like to keep continuing uh, being a part of this <laughs> this community. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry, everyone, that I have to leave. Um, and thank you for letting me in this space. I, Yes, thank you, Dr. Abdul Hadi, um, and um, and everyone. Um, so um, I I think uh, I'd like to go to the second round, uh, building on what you already shared, and uh, we were planning to discuss like um, the significance of remembering for justice, um, and uh, you already are speaking on that, and. Um, and one of the questions that we are raising was um, in face of new liberalization of our universities and what Dr. Abdul Hadi called new McCarthyism, how um, did Japanese Latin American and Japanese Americans defy incarceration and enforce participation in um, US shop? I mean, defy incarceration and enforced participation in U.S. chauvinistic state, and how do we manifest this in our DOR commemoration on campus? Um, but also, I'm wondering we, uh, if you could talk about um, like what has been done and what are the similarities um, between um, the redress movements and our uh, Palestinian justice movements, and why. Uh, we engage in solidarity. Um, and also I'd like to um, speak from the, um, from my Chinese, Korean and Japanese backgrounds, like about why um, the way remembering and why um, uniting together. And um, so um, I think I could, I pass this to, you, Grace, and then uh, to Dr. Abdul Hadi, and yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th that's a lot of questions in there. So it might be good to kind of try and break it down a bit. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand. I, I just want to make sure what I, I should be addressing and when. Uh, as I understand it, you want to talk about um, kind of resistance 
uh, um, defying incarceration and um, I guess uh, post-war as well. And then also talking about solidarity, if, if I understand correctly. Yes. Okay, well, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna address. <laughs> Okay, so um, um, if you, I mean, I, I'd like you to speak what you would like to share with us as well. So um, those are just a point of orientations for. Okay, excuse me. Discussion right the okay, well, in just in terms of like resistance during the incarceration and post-war and after. Um, I guess it's good to say that, you know, the Nikkei or the Japanese American community has never been homogeneous. You know, we're rather diverse in our background and experience. So during World War II, as the Nikkei community, you know, was un undergoing government repression and incarceration, Nikkei as individuals, families, and as a community were in turmoil, you know, trying to figure out how to respond, how to survive. So hard decisions had to be made with limited information. And, um, you know, some families were torn apart and forever estranged. So in terms of trying to figure out what to do, you know, and how to do it, some collaborated with the U.S. government, including identifying potentially dangerous community members and informing. Others uh, felt that it was important to prove their loyalty and in some way, um, they, uh, you know, joined the army or the military intelligence service and saw this as a way also of protecting their parents that were still in the concentration camps. And then on the other hand, we had uh, uh, young men who were draft resistors who did time in the penitentiary and faced uh, purposeful stigma after the war, you know. And then in response to the loyalty questionnaire, uh, this is like two questions about do people for, uh, answer yes or no to forswearing allegiance to the emperor and then whether people will fight for the army. Well, those questions, that questionnaire was very difficult for people because um, the question that asked for swearing allegiance to the emperor meant if you were an immigrant, uh, you would be giving up your citizenship like with Japan and you be, would become a person without a country. And then for U.S. citizens, it's like uh, answering a question that is has a kind of a, um, you'd be admitting that you had allegiance to the emperor, which you were for swearing, you know. And then in terms of fighting for the U.S. Uh, army, it's like, um, you know, many folks also felt uh, what a contradiction it was to uh, while your parents and your siblings are still held in a concentration camp and facing these kind of constitutional and human rights violations. And that depending on how you answered the questionnaire, your family could get separated, you know, because those who answered no, no, were put uh, segregated in the Tule Lake camp. So um, it was difficult times, you know, to figure out how, uh, how to respond. But when injustice happens, there is that natural response. People want to respond. And so we did have um, within the camps, you know, uh, demonstrations, rallies, strikes, those kind of things. And there, the tanks were come out, you know, and the soldiers with their guns came out, you know, and people were um, killed. People were uh, brutalized, you know, and let's see. But, um, but the idea of resistance too, I think, um, happens afterwards. It continues. So when uh, the Japanese Americans were able to break the silence, then it's like you see the uh, resistance and the standing up coming through the redress movement. And it was a tremendous achievement, you know, that they, uh, that the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was passed. But for us J uh, JLAs, 
you know, the terror was uh, during the war, the terror was inflicted on our families and communities. And uh, it, in terms of resisting in camps, it's like we learned from the Germans who were in the same camps as we that about the Geneva Convention and to speak out against the violations. And it's with the help of lawyers like the um, Ernest Bessig and Wayne Collins of the ACLU that we were able to assert our rights to improve camp conditions, stop deportation orders, and facilitate release from camp after the war ended. But, you know, JLA's had a hard time learning how to survive after the war in the U.S., being labeled as an illegal alien, not knowing the language, the customs, how the society and government worked, and then figuring out how to reestablish and rebuild your life and community. So it was really through the um, redress struggle that JLA's began to organize, have organized resistance uh, and uh, for justice. And um, this is how we see that the wartime and redress histories of the JAs and JLAs are integrally related. We became part of the JA community in the camps and it continued through resettlement and to today. And we have an integrally related history of exclusion, forced removal, extraordinary rendition, indefinite detention, hostage exchange, post-war deportation, denial of redress and reparations. So, uh, and so it's in this stage that we are, um, stage two, you know, that we are mobilizing for social justice action. And uh, by knowing our history, we can better understand and glean lessons to face the challenges of today. And this, we have found that this must be collaborative work with other communities. Um, what we are engaging in and asking others to join us in is exposing the fuller historical truth of the US government's World War II and domestic and foreign policies and actions. We're expanding and making more inclusive the wartime and redress narrative. And at the same time, we're reaffirming that the violations were also a racist attack intersecting with xenophobia and nativism against persons of Japanese ancestry, regardless of citizenship and residency. Our struggle is for historical truth, justice, democracy in action. And it's through our collaborative work that we're sharing and learning together and developing understanding, respect, trust, support, solidarity. We're building the personal and inner community ties and relations to prevent recurrence of these crimes against humanity and to envision and chart the way forward together for a better society and world. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, as we continue our discussion, um, I also like to invite the, um, uh, those of you who are listening to us um, to share with us your questions and suggestions for education and solidarity. Um, so we can address that at the end of the um, webinar. Um, I'd like, I'd like Dr. Abdurhadi to discuss um, the issue of, I mean, um, about what I remember um, um, and also why are comm commemorations even more important in the current environment of white supremacy, xenophobia, anti-Asian violence, and anti-Palestinian hostility. Um, sure. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that it's really, as you know, one of the main uh, points of the teaching Palestine uh, pedagogical practice and the indivisibility of justice uh, that um, I have initiated that we are continuing is the question of not only commemoration. So we use important anniversaries that we commemorate uh, and that are commemorated by the people. So these are not actually uh, anniversaries that are necessarily imposed from above such as, for example, the so-called uh, July 4th, you know, people go do barbecues and celebrate 
what I would say is the anniversary of the declaration of the U.S. settler colonial state, which uh, for, let's say, maybe, I mean, people oppose it, but I would say for indigenous people in the U.S., in particular on Turtle Island, must feel the same way as the Rekba, the, the, the foundation of Israel on May 15th, 1948, which you alluded to, Professor Kinakawa, when you spoke about 75th anniversary that coming up. But this anniversary that we're looking at is why people commemorate anniversaries. The Day of Remembrance was actually established, and that was one of the classrooms we had. It was established by people, came by people to say that we have to remember. And we have to keep reminding the younger generation, pass on, uh, from elders, what we call the living archives in, uh, in our project, to the younger people. So history is passed on, both the history as well as the experiences, the, 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 the advantages, the successes, the failures, the challenges in a critical manner. So, and this is what, uh, what Grace was already speaking about when you were talking about the different ways in which people, let's say, responded and engaged in the whole question of this huge, horrible uh, violence that was imposed on, on, on people of Japanese descent, I would say now, because Japanese Americans, it's majority Japanese, Japanese Americans, Japanese Latin Americans, and then there are a few other like uh, Jewish, Italian, German uh, nationalities and so on. But it's really important. And I also remember that when we started the joint project with the with the Buenavista United Methodist Church, and it was actually suggested by a student of mine who's who's half Filipina, half Palestinian, who took the Palestine class and was working in Buena Vista, and suggested that we really need to do something like this. So we ended up with a project called Stories of Palestinian Diasporas, and the reason kind of because. Michael Yoshi used to always say, we have to remember history. If we don't remember history, nobody will remember. And it's very interesting because the same parallel issues are also happening in the Palestinian community. So we commemorate, but also I think it's really an, an important, uh, let's say, conceptual theoretical point to make is that uh, some folks use the question of commemoration in the academy or in scholarship as just a, all the commemorations are the same. And not all the commemorations are the same. First, as I said, it's all the, the imposed from above versus the things that come from the people and the grassroots and so on. Second is to explain why do people commemorate. And then thirdly, when we commemorate, how do we commemorate in a way that becomes uh, uh, challenging the existing knowledge, challenging the, 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 the dominant hegemonic information and so on and say, there are all these stories. I mean, I really learned through attending Day of Remembrance and going to all these events about the Nono boys, the, the, the young men who refused to uh, join, as uh, Grace mentioned, and became draft resistors. And also all the, 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 the students at San Francisco State that you've mentioned, Dr. Kinakawa, the 19 students who were forced to uh, get out of school and then they were incarcerated in the in the incarcer incarceration camps. And we have the same similar phenomena in the Palestinian community in the Arab, I will just say maybe in Palestinian community, I'm talking about worldwide, transnational, not just in the US, but elsewhere. And the Arab American community, when you are faced with a disaster of this sort, what do you do? There are elements within the community that decide to basically uh, lay, not lay low only, but to actually accommodate themselves to the system and assimilate. And I think this is really a big problem, especially for uh, indigenous and communities of color and for uh, marginalized communities, because no matter how much you try to assimilate, the system that you are trying to assimilate into will never assimilate you. They will claim that they are assimilating you because it becomes a very useful thing to uh, use members of our communities such as these various projects that are called today the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that are all used as a rubber stamp, as a band-aid to cover up what's going on by various power structures, especially neoliberal, including our own university, US government, state authorities, and so on, to kind of say that this is what, what is going on. Everything is okay. We found a brown face. We found an Asian face. We found the Arab face. We found a woman with hijab and so on in order for them to actually basically rubber stamp and use them as native informants to split our ranks. And then, and so this is the very, very important device. But the thing is, is that we never get completely assimilated. 
we are always given uh, the cake and saying the crumbs of the cake and say go fight over it and we say that why why crumbs of the cake we i'm talking the people who are really oppressed and have faced all this violence should be entitled to the whole thing we should not be and we should not also be like given a coin and saying flip so divide and rule saying that is also a tool that is used by the the the, the, the powers that uh, repress us so i think it, in the process of understanding history and discussing history and saying what are the lessons, what are some of the experiences, I think it's really important to point out that there are diverse experiences and so on. But also it's really important to, and I think as somebody who is committed to this, and I know we all are, the question of the justice-centered knowledge production to actually also point out what does this mean and provide resources and material that is not necessarily available in every day and that the right wing and the white supremacists and the racists now are trying to completely get rid of it so even the little that students in the in, in classical or conventional context don't learn about that the last thing is that uh, uh, grace you mentioned the four geneva convention i think it's really important this is one uh, thing that is uh, the four geneva convention applies to the treatment of people in the in the situation of war and occupation that there is a responsibility for the occupying or colonizing power or controlling power towards the, the, the people who are colonized. And it was adopted actually specifically in reference to Greek and French Jews, which uh, the Nazi Germany moved them from one place to the other, quote unquote, transferred them, sent them to concentration camps uh, in, 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 in Europe that produced the Holocaust and so on and so forth. So this is actually saying that this is not okay. This is not allowed. And this is something that the U.S. has violated with the, with the, with the, uh, um, the, the incarceration camps and the, in, in, the, in the Second World War and that uh, have used it also after 9-11-2001, whether we talk about Guantanamo or the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. And, it, and it's using it today. Israel is using it day in and day out. In its uh, in in its um, in the way that it is actually treating the Palestinian people who are the indigenous people of the land, and I'm talking about the Palestinian areas that were occupied in '67, which also brings up the question and why there needs to be accountability, why we need not only never forget and never allow it to be repeated, but also we need to hold accountable those forces who are committing these crimes against all our peoples. I don't think it's okay to just say, I forgive and move on, because bullies are never going to be stopped unless we hold them accountable. They're not going to turn and become nicer people out of the goodness of their hearts. When you have power and resources, you're going to hold on to them. So it's really, really important to actually come together to hold these forces, including the government of Israel and the United States vis-a-vis, -vis, and the whole question of what's happened, which I, I know you will be speaking about, Dr. Kinakawa, the whole question of what, what happens to uh, victims, sexual victims, uh, uh, violent, uh, viol violated victims, and so on in the Second World War and everywhere that are actually never, most of the time are not even mentioned. And there is a lot of uh, what, you're to what you actually keep talking about as denialism, the, the term that you use a lot and conceptualize. So it's really, really important to do that and important to teach about it and important to keep raising this and impo very important to come together and express solidarity because if we don't, Nobody is going to nobody is going to hand us our rights. We actually have to demand them, come together, and 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 fight for it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, make brief comments. Um, please stop me in ten minutes uh, because I'd like to have Q and A at the end and uh, have your final um, comments. But I just want to make two points um i um so i'd like to go back to this i mean i'd like to go back to that um discussion about radicalism and um and also the significance of ahmed and ahmed open classrooms and teaching palestine that uh, dr abdul hadi has conceptualized and organized um on our campus over years for us everyone on our campus and beyond. And um, the Ahmed has offered a critical space to fight against um, the violent suppression of anti-colonial narratives. Um, and um, 
uh, and that studies are especially threatening to Zionists because uh, they empower all communities to defend anti-colonial narratives through insisting on the indivisibility of justice and building upon the and build upon the radical third world coalition that um, SFSU student strikers envisioned, and then Dr. Abdul Hadi has developed uh, over the decades. And um, I'd like to um, share, like, what I experienced uh, in while collaborating with Dr. Abdul Hadi. It's just one of many, many cases for Dr. Abdul Hadi, but that's the one I experienced, which is that silencing of our own open classroom, whose narratives, gender justice and resistance, a conversation with, with Leila Hallett. And that was shut that up. Oh, that was a webinar similar to this one that we are offering today. And that guy, that guy that got silenced when Zoom and other private companies shut up the webinar. Um, and um, white supremacists and Zionists attempted to criminalize us uh, using so-called anti-terrorist laws. Um, and SFSU administration um, not, didn't protect us from those attacks, but uh, instead, uh, became part of threatening us. And um, instead of critiquing exceptionalizing Palestine, SFSU administration normalized that exceptionalization through pressuring us to make teaching Palestine quote unquote op optional to cater to Zionists. Um, and, um, and the SFSU administration, as we discussed already, sponsored um, uh, the racist report and also spoke at the counter event that Zionists organized to demonize our own open classroom on feminist anti-colonial narratives. Um, and, um, and it's one of many cases where SFSU has attempted to demolish the Ahmed studies altogether. And so the question that I think we are asking on our campus is what we really want. And um, are we giving in to Zionist attempts to diminish this precious space for justice-centered and community accountable knowledge production um, that Dr. Abzuhadi and student strikers have fought for? Or are we letting Zionists and Israel to demolish it, um, just like um, the universities led 19 students, Japanese students being interned during World War II? Um, and especially for those of us who teach critical ethnic studies and women's gender studies, there's no choice but to rise up. Um, and um, and also the other point I like to I wanted to make is that I am coming from a background like I'm a I call I identify myself as a queer scholar activist with Chinese Korean and Japanese ancestries. And you may not know, but Zionist Koreans are known, well, they are known for their fierce social justice movements and are post-colonial subjects in Japan, including many conscripted, conscripted laborers um, under Japan's colonial rule and their descendants. And um, in six, 600 and thousand Zionist Koreans were made stateless by San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1952, four years after the Nakba and were deemed enemy Aryans in their version without basic civil and human rights. Um, so, and as my Zionist Korean comrade and colleague Miho Kim reminded me a few week, weeks ago, 2023 also marks the 100th anniversary of the Kanto massacre of Koreans who are residing in the colonial metropole. Um, the, and the massacre was by the Japanese government, military police and vigilantes. Um, and that continued over several weeks after the massive earthquake hit Kanto area of Japan in 1923. And uh, far-right politicians, including mayor of Tokyo, continue to deny the history of violence crime itself. Um, and um, it's the same with the case of the Nanjing massacre that took place 24 years later in 1937. Um, and so the Japanese far-right government um, fuels historical denialism in collusion with US and Israel now, and, um, and they escalate uh, these racist and anti-colonial attacks on all communities, including Palestinians, but also they propel anti-Chinese and anti-Asian hate in the US. Um, 
And so it's important. Um, and, and then uh, they collude and attempt to influence our curriculums and the institutions of knowledge to legitimize their respective denialism and suppression of anti-colonial, anti-imperial narratives at our universities and other institutions of knowledge. And there, I can share many examples, but I skip them uh, because of the limits of time. But um, I'm just thinking that for our critique of imperial construction of enemy areas to stick, our critique also must cross imperial borders and we must refuse to be blinded by opportunistic alliances and enemy making among those imperial states themselves. And um, in other words, US-Japan collusion after World War II, which became the um, basis of more recent US-Israel-Japan collusion, was prepared by affinity in imperial designs of both empires, even while US deems Japan to be its enemy. And I'm referring back to Dr. Abdul Hadi's analysis that I quoted in the beginning. And in that sense, we must refuse to be blinded by post-World War II US-Japan alliance as a solution or like an end to the construction of Japanese American as enemy aliens. And on the contrary, the alliances became an engine for construction and continuation of other communities, including Palestinians, Arab Muslim communities, as well as Chinese Koreans, Chinese, North Koreans, and other Asian Americans as enemy aliens. So, um, and, um, and I, uh, like for me, the power of SFSU DOR is that I met um, and Japanese Americans, Japanese Latin Americans, Asian American studies uh, have refused to give into settler colonial ethno nationalist framing that stops their critique of imperial construction of enemy aliens at the outer edge of their ethnic communities. And they refuse to take a settler colonial state given uh, as something transparent and given and learn from indigenous critique of settler colonialisms and they braved to stand in solidarity with all the communities who are targeted by imperial construction of enemy aliens, crossing borders as a critical part of the critique of such a colonialism and imperialism. So, um, yes, I, I'm, I had more that I wanted to say, but I just stopped there. And um, the, um, let's see, do we have um, questions or? What is I don't let me check, but I don't see comments in here on the stream yard. Um, let me just check. You're muted, Rabab. I thought, oh, sorry, all of this time I was muted? I don't know. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was just saying that maybe we can just discuss among ourselves. And also, I'm wondering if Lais, if you can, if you don't mind, just posting some resources like the, the, the various pages and as well as like if people want to send questions to Ahmed, and which email to use, because uh, we don't really, um, unfortunately, we don't have any funding from the university or something. So we don't use anymore the Ahmed staff email because it doesn't exist. So I'm just thinking if we can, we can actually have a conversation among ourselves, picking mm -hmm. up on different things that, you know. Yes, and I think part of it is that our students, like there are two classes that joined and uh, one class ended, then the new class just joined. So I think they are still, um, like uh, um, forming their questions. And so um, I think that's part of it, that, um, how this discuss was planned. And so, um, so yeah, um, so I'd like, so maybe um, Grace and then Dr. Abdul Hadi, would you like to give us the final um, reflections and- um, And you, yeah. And me, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I just think that it's important 
uh, the work that has been done on San Francisco State University, uh, especially around the Day of Remembrance, to keep that tradition alive. Uh, it's an important collaboration between the students and the professors and all the folks, you know, uh, especially uh, uh, between Ahmed and Asian American Studies. Um, and I, I really encourage that uh, deepening and continuing of the collaboration because, uh, you know, we are in very difficult times, you know, in this country, in this world. There really is this threat of authoritarianism, rising fascism to our democracy, to our just the, our lives, you know, and the the things that we've been talking about, the danger to just our education institutions, the danger of the historical denialism, the erasure, you know, the importance of, of the re remembrances, and not only just the importance of remembering, but really understanding what we're remembering mm -hmm. and being able to do something with those lessons to make life better. And it has to be a collective effort. It's not going to just be by individuals on their own. And in that way, it's kind of like I think about the importance of legacy, you know, of being uh, passing this on. Uh, and it's an intergenerational responsibility. And uh, it's something that we have to do um, because no one's going to do it for us to make sure that what is important gets passed on and that is useful for our communities. And I think in that way, um, what is happening on the, around DOR, for example, is the collaboration between campus and community. Uh, that which we struggle so hard for during all the ethnic studies. Rose, I think uh, you. Great, Rose. Yeah. Um, well, we can continue, and then when oh here now Grace is back. Okay. Bye, Grace. Yeah. I think you got frozen for a while, so. Oh, well, I said wonderful things, but um, anyway, it's just to say that uh, the collaborative effort at San Francisco State is really important to continue, and um, especially in terms of the uh, relationship between community and campus and keeping that spirit of 68 alive, you know, and um, I just want to thank so much you know, for uh, Dr. Abdahadi and Dr. Kiyokawa for all that you're doing on campus. Thank you so much. I can go very quickly. Well, first, I really want to actually, again, affirm how, how important it has been the support that we're having from you, Grace, and from people like you who continue to really uh, have our back and refusing to be silent and basically holding the university administration accountable. We talked about all the powers. I mean, the, the, Dr. Kinakawa, you mentioned the so supposedly the US-Japanese agreement, which is really in, let's just say, in our case, it's very similar to Oslo agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. It was not, it did not uphold what Japanese needed. And then now they're even trying to destroy it further. and. Uh, Japan saying that we're not militarized. Now all of the stuff is being turned around. And that is very, very dangerous. Very kind of that's the, the legacy of, uh, of um, leaning towards peace, refusing militarization, refusing to invest in arms and so on. It's being threatened. And a lot of people, and I think if we are not insisting on challenging the way we teach, which you both uh, spoke about, uh, it's really important that people forget and use it as sort of like an ordinary thing. Uh, I want, so I think it's really important to do that. Uh, today, for example, is the anniversary of uh, the Wounded Knee massacre mm -hmm. of the American Indian movement. And I, um, I was reminded uh, by it also because uh, two days ago, James Aburizek, who was the only Arab American senator, and he was also of indigenous descent. And he became uh, the founder of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, 
one of the major civil rights organizations for Arab Americans in the U.S. He also, one of the main acts he did, he passed, he promoted and pushed for uh, acts around the uh, child welfare, and they, they call it Bureau of Indian Affairs. But we know this is for indigenous children, the whole question of accountability, the question of sovereignty, which is also now being challenged within the U.S. as well. I mean, there is a lot of proposals in Congress, to, to, including to getting to the Supreme Court, to take away the sovereignty of, of uh, indigenous lands yeah. and ability and so on. And it also, this reminds us also that what achievements we make, we cannot take them for granted. So, uh, uh, um, a, and by the way, he was also, James Arwizarek was also with other people kind of like uh, present around that time, uh, asked to go and negotiate around it. And we should remember, and Leonard Peltier is still in prison after all these many years. And that was also very much part of the legacies of 68, the 68 spirit. But we cannot just say 68 is something that happened and basically use it to have a plaque at San Francisco State uh, because there is a responsibility with owning up to a particular legacy. There is a responsibility to say, so what does this really mean? It's not something that we can say, okay, so we own 68 and we're going to hold on to it, but we're going to do everything that against what the student from the Black Student Union and Third World Liberation Front struck. They struck to actually have a different decolonize the curriculum. They struck to actually have the university be accountable to the community. They struck for the experimental college. They struck for tuition-free education. They struck for, for, for uh, um, uh, making, connecting the university with the community and opening, dissolving these borders that the academy acts like I, um, the ivory towers. And, and I'm not talking about the ivory towers with capital I, capital T. I'm talking about even public schools like ours, that is supposed to be accountable to the public, that's actually doing away with all that legacy of all these things that learned from 68, that we should be continue doing it, or we're not really, we should not, we should not attempt to call ourselves or connect ourselves with that legacy. So I think it's really important. But that also requires resources, to requires people to have, to have our back, requires people to support faculty who take the steps to challenge and work and so on, because this involves, like even putting up this webinar together, involves so much labor, intellectual labor, physical labor, emotional labor, <coughs> that really that is not something that we get paid for. This is all stuff that we do on our own. I'm a sabbatical. I'm not even supposed to be teaching or doing anything at all. Dr. Konikawa is a lecturer. Dr. Konikawa doesn't get paid except for the classes she, you, you, that they teach in their classroom and so on. All of the stuff that we've decided to do, the open classrooms, we made a decision when COVID happened that we are not going to deprive our students from the ability to meet people that we invite as guests in our classrooms. And most of the guests, because we have no money to give honorary or something, they come for free. They pay for their own parking. Sometimes they even take us to lunch <laughs> we don't, because we don't have the money to do that. We have students who volunteer step up to help. We have people from the community saying, I'll pick up this person, I'll drive this person around, I will do this. I actually remember that when we had Yuri Kuchiyama in 2008 and the, the, when we did the 40th anniversary of the strike, it was people from the community who brought you to Yuri Kuchiyama to speak at that panel. We had the plenary revolution in there. You're not going to find it on Ahmed because the university crossed off Ahmed on the Diva, which is the video thing, and put in the College of Ethnic Studies. So we're Basically, we've been erased, kind of like a lot of the, our achievements are gone. But this is how, how Yuri Kuchiyama came. This is how a lot of people come. People say, okay, I'll pick you up. I'll drive you. I'll pick you up when we go to uh, uh, Fruit Vale Station. We're going to Buena Vista or something. Somebody will meet us like Grace, for example. I'll pick you up. Remember, we'll take you to this event and that. All the labor that we're putting into, this is a lot. And it's a lot. It takes a toll on people's health ability to survive and so on. We continue doing it because we believe in it, but it's really, really important for support because if there is no support, what, what the repressive forces do create new McCarthyism, this chilling effect and make us radioactive. And of course they go around uh, uh, smearing us, ruining our reputation, trying to claim all sorts of things in order to divert. And part of it is, is to scare other people and get other people to be afraid to actually take on the step. And so people start becoming 
police their own syllabi, police their own teaching, police anything they are doing and so on, not because they don't believe in it, but because they also want to survive, they want to have their careers, they want to have income and so on. And at the same time, also to distract from the good work that we're doing. So the, all these attacks also, then you go to the internet and we became so smeared, so nobody even remembers all of the stuff that are doing, which also becomes a model for other people to do open classrooms, to change their curriculum, to change their syllabi and so on. So I'm, I, 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 was, um, I have to say that this is, this is the initiative from uh, you, Grace, and you, Tomomi, Dr. Kinakawa, to actually hold this and connect the, the dots and bring people together has been really, really amazing. And, you know, it's, it's been exhausting, but it's really worth it. But I think we really need to recognize that it requires people coming together, movement building, resources, support, holding uh, powers accountable, speaking truth to power. So we will be able to continue doing what we need to do and not let our histories be erased. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Grace Shimizu and Dr. Rabab Abdurhabi for all the work you have done and um, the ways in which uh, you keep um, teaching us and inspire us and lead us and guide us. And um, I really appreciate it, this um, opportunity to um, hear from both of you. And I really appreciate it that um, students in many classes had an opportunity to um, to listen to your directory, and um, I think it's um, that's a power of open classrooms that um, I met open classrooms, and so thank you very much. And I think um, time is up, and so um, if uh, unless there's one more comments, um, I'd like to. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let's. Um, and our conversation for now to but to be continued so thank you very much for everyone who was listening thank you for amazing moderation um, as well yeah